Uh, ethnologues and respectively Rakhangan peoples um, whose territory the university spans and the Songhees, Eskwima, and Rasamic peoples. Today we have a really interesting presentation um, on Hospital at Home uh, by Sean Spiner and uh, uh, Tara McMillan. So just some background, uh, Dr. Spiner graduated from the University of British Columbia, faculty of pharmaceutical sciences with a BSc in pharmacy and a doctor in ph of, of pharmacy, in addition to being the coordinator of clinical services at Royal Jubilee Hospital, is also a clinical associate professor at the University of British Columbia Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, and an adjunct professor with the University of the Victoria Art School, hence. Um, and also presenting today will be Perry McMillan, who is manager, patient and public research engagement uh, manager at um, Island Health. Um, and Tara is a research and health professional with a background in public health, academic research and project management. So with that, I will pass it on to Sean to talk about hospital at home. Fantastic. Um, thank you very, very much, uh, Andre, for inviting us here today to uh, to share our story with you and uh, and everybody who's uh, who's listening. It's truly a privilege to to be here to um, to present to you. Um, if you, um, I'm I'm sharing my background, so you may have to flop me over to speaker view, so you can actually so I fill up your entire screen if um, if I'm only a little tiny corner in the in the side of your Zoom. So. Anyway, um, so my slides will be flipping in the background here. So welcome to the talk. Um, Tara and I are very excited to uh, be here today and share our journey that we've been on over the last couple of years. I um, feel privileged that I've uh, had the opportunity to work with uh, Andre and uh, Dr. Elizabeth Berkey as well um, over the last couple of years on this, uh, on this work. And um, we will continue on. So I lead a, a research program here at, uh, at Island Health. It's called the uh, Alternatives to Traditional Hospital Care Offered in Monitored Environments, our uh, at-home um, investigator group, which Andre and uh, Elizabeth are part of um, as well. So as far as disclosures go, um, I have uh, unrestricted research grants from Vocera, as well as I uh, am a member of HP's Global Healthcare Advisory Committee. And I also received loan technology from Apple Canada and Clean Slate UV for, um, for evaluation purposes. And uh, Tara doesn't have any conflicts. So many of you may have heard about Hospital at Home and uh, but how it came uh, to me is it was proposed almost two years ago to me. Um, so I'm a, I'm a pharmacist by training um, and I also lead a research program. So I was approached by a, a couple of physician leads who uh, said, hey, Sean, what do you think about um, um, hospital at home? We, we can provide acute care hospital services to the patients in their home. And I said originally, well, that sounds fantastic, but um, um, I don't know much about how to deliver pills because I do uh, uh, clinical work on uh, at the hospital, at the hospital here. Um, but my question truly was: was how are you going to evaluate and uh, and assess the impact that this care is having? And and then I was in, brought into the the process. So I wanted to ensure that when we're building and researching this program, and it's in a Canadian context that we were meeting the needs of all the stakeholders, including uh, various patients, uh, uh, family caregivers, um, the health system decision makers and uh, clinical, clinical staff. So what hospital at home really is, is it's an acute care level hospital care that is delivered in the comfort of the patient's homes. Uh, patients will actually come into the hospital um, when they're sick, um, they'll be uh, admitted if necessary to the hospital, and then we'll basically be caring for them in the, the comfort of their home. We've implemented some technologies, um, communication tools, and uh, other systems to allow patients to go home. What I've learned over the years of researching this and, and evaluating it is we have to be very clear on the model because a lot of people will say they're delivering hospital at home. Um, hospital at home. How dif what differentiates our program from other hospital at home programs is that when patients are not 
patients who are in our program and they're at home in their beds, if they um, deteriorate, for example, they actually get admitted directly back into the hospital, which is different than um, other systems that are monitoring patients in maybe a palliative setting or they've been discharged from the patients as more of a chronic disease state management patient um, type of patient. Whereas if they actually deteriorate at home, they actually go, go back to the emergency room. Our patients are actively followed by a medical team we have uh, physicians from the hospital, we have nurses from the hospital and pharmacists from the hospital who actually go out to the patient's homes and care for them. Uh, we see them multiple times a day. And where this came from is on Vancouver Island in the Victoria Bowl, um, the projections are that in the next 10 years, we're gonna have to build another hospital the size of the Royal Jubilee Hospital to accommodate the growing um, um, demands on healthcare delivery um, in Victoria. And that's very expensive to build a hospital. And there is a movement um, in Australia and New Zealand and Spain, Portugal, um, of doing this hospital at home for the last probably 10 to 30 years in Australia. They've been doing it for almost 30 years, but it's never really taken off in North America. And so what happened is in the fall of 2019, uh, we were starting down this path and then COVID hit and we were accelerated down the path as trying to find a solution for, to care for people who are not COVID positive um, in their own, own home. So um, at that point, um, we accelerated our program. <clears throat> so to do the work we have, it's uh, an island health uh, program, but we've had incredible supports from uh, the BC uh, support unit, which uh, provided us with a research grant to do public engagement, which I will be speaking about. We also have funding from the Victoria Hospitals Foundation, um, Delaney, the engagement people, um, was hired as a contractor through some of our research, and um, we're also working collaboratively meeting with the Ministry of Health on a, on a weekly basis as we move this forward. So there's a video here, but I'm going to show it to you at the very end just because it'll be easy for, for ease of, uh, of use. So. so what happened was in January of last year, of 2020, we had this BC Support Unit uh, grant in order to um, engage the public on um, understanding what indicators of success are. So this is a brand new program, the first time it's been done in a Canadian context. In March, as the pandemic uh, grappled and grasped and, and held on um, to Canada, we actually were asked to move it forward much quicker um, by the Ministry of Health. Um, we moved forward with uh, getting a contractor with uh, Delaney and Associates to actually do our public engagement work. Um, through last summer, we planned for all of our patient-oriented research and public engagement um, work to be completed. Um, we started last September um, to launch our public engagement work. And what we found was the day we were about to launch our, our survey, the government called an election. And um, I learned a lot about elections and I've learned a lot about uh, what you can and can't do um, during an election cycle, but you cannot do public engagement at all as a as a government entity, um, which we are in the health authority uh, during an election cycle. So we had to pause everything and we launched everything in December. Uh, we've just reviewed the results and we've published them on our, on our website. And we're actually go heading down the road of doing a formal research program and protocol through a harmonized approach through UBC. So what we've done is we have actually start built a brand new model of care, the delivery of a brand new way of delivering healthcare services to people on Vancouver Island, um, also in, in British Columbia is where we're going as well. And <clears throat> I'm a pharmacist by nature. I lead a pharmacy, clinical pharmacy team at the hospital, but we had to collaborate with um, about 25 to 30 different groups in order to pull this together. And it was an incredibly rewarding uh, group of people who came together um, with a shared vision about uh, making this thing successful. And it's been in, in, truly inspiring to see it happen. And in the middle there, you can see, this is our, our research team consisting of uh, myself and Tara on the left and um, a variety of other people. Traditionally, research and island health decision support folks haven't worked together in tandem. And this is one of the rare times and, and, and novel times when we can actually work side by side. Um, there are island health decision support people who are working with us as we try to form uh, a mixed methods, qualitative and quantitative evaluation of the project um, as we and, and, and subsequent uh, publications. It's been quite the adventure. 
it was important to us that um, we follow the quadruple aim framework um, in all of our evaluations because um, this is the first time in Canada that we've pulled a project together like this. And we wanted to make sure that it's uh, how we're evaluating it um, is aligned with other quality um, improvement um, processes. So we're gonna make sure that we're improving or we're gonna aim to improve the health of the population enhance the uh, experience and outcomes of the patients, uh, reduce the cost uh, of care and um, for the benefit of uh, the communities. And we wanna improve the experiences of the providers. And we're gonna use a mixed methods, qualitative and quantitative analysis to do this. As I mentioned earlier, we are in collaboration um, with the research and decision support folks. So even though I work for Island Health and have a few other appointments, um, we do work seamlessly with the decision support folks. So we undertook uh, a public engagement strategy and, uh, and um, we will talk about that in a few minutes. We're also going to be doing a full comprehensive financial evaluation with the um, local people here as, a, as an economical evaluation. We're going to be looking at clinical outcomes for this program and comparing it to current state. Also, we're going to be looking in detail at the technology that we've implemented, and I'll go through that in a few minutes. And one of the key and most important things to capture here is the experiences of the patients, the caregivers, as well as the, the clinicians. And we've gone all the way up through the Ministry of Health as well to understand their experiences um, and what their needs are for the program. With that said, I'd like to turn um, it over to uh, to Tara to um, to take the next few slides about patient-oriented research. Perfect. Thanks, Sean. Uh, so I'm going to back us up a little bit for a second and just talk about sort of patient-oriented research or POR a little more broadly. Um, and I see some familiar names uh, on the participants list, so that is great. I know there's some folks who've uh, done this before. Um, but for those of you who are new to patient-oriented research or maybe wondering a little bit about what it is, um, so traditionally, um, you know, we study patients, uh, we come up with a research study and then we, you know, test things on patients. Um, but Sean, sorry, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, in patient-oriented research, um, I mean, we can also study patients, but we really aim to do uh, research in partnership with patients as part of the research team uh, and to answer questions that actually really matter to patients and measure outcomes that matter most to patients, because sometimes um, those are going to be different than what the health system thinks is most important or what decision makers or clinicians think is most important. So, um, and even more than just having patients involved, it's about having all of the stakeholders at the table um, from the very beginning and right through the process to make sure that we're meeting the needs of everybody um, who's gonna be impacted by the research that we're doing. Next slide, please. Um, so I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about who we mean by patient, because uh, we toss that term around a lot and it can mean different things in different contexts. Um, when we say patient uh, in, the, in the context of patient-oriented research, it's a really broad term. Um, next slide. Uh, so it can actually mean all of these things. So really, it's it's anyone with any lived experience of uh, a health issue, um, and that can also include that um, you know caregivers, especially in hospital at home, where um, a patient at home has to have an informal caregiver uh, who's there with them. You know, friends, family. It can it can talk about different things. It doesn't just have to be someone who's in the health system at the moment who's a patient. Um, you know, somebody who maybe was hospitalized in the past. Um, we would still maybe consider a patient because their lived experience is still relevant. So just to say that there's a lot of different words that we can use to talk about patients, but really the whole idea is to include um, people with lived experience in designing the research, in conducting the research, and, and in evaluating it. And in this case, um, also in designing the program uh, and looking at how it's doing and making, making changes that, that are important to the program. Um, it's, sorry, can you go to the next slide? This is my favorite slide, um, and this kind of represents sort of the difference between doing it right and doing it twice. Um, and so I think this just represents really beautifully how, um, you know, you can have a lot of brilliant minds at the table and you build something that you think is going to be really great. Uh, and the way people use it uh, is sometimes actually really different. And sometimes maybe if we spent a little more time up front uh, and talked to folks and, and really asked and, and tried to get at the meat of what the needs are and how people are going to use things, um, then sometimes we can, we can, you know, build something that's going to work a little bit better for everybody right off the bat. Sean, did you want to add anything to this one? Great, next slide. 
Um, so just uh, to briefly mention the International Association of Public Participation, Spectrum of Public Participation, um, which Sean's going to talk a little bit about the engagement process that we went through next. Um, but this is just to say that when we're involving folks um, from all of the different stakeholder groups in a research project or in program development, there's different um, levels of engagement. So um, whether it's just, you know, at the inform level where you're just providing information all the way up to the empower level where you're giving decision making power uh, to a stakeholder group. Um, this isn't, I guess, I think it's important to mention that this isn't like a, a scale of like not good to the best. Um, I, all of these are, are valid and are good engagement methods as long as they're done meaningfully and well. Um, so uh, we in this project uh, with our public engagement, we, we used a couple of different levels in the mean in the middle here. So the consult we our um, survey that we did was at the, the consult level, which makes it a little easier to um, gather a lot of opinions. Uh, and we also have a few a couple of patient partners who are on our research and uh, program teams as well. And they're more at the collaborate level where they actually get to um, stick their hand up and say like, this is how we should do something. And, and the team has committed to uh, rolling those into uh, program decisions that are made. Next slide. And I think I'll turn it back over to Sean. You are on mute. You think after 16 months of doing this, I'd figure that out. Um, thank you very much, Tara. I really appreciate that, um, that background about what patient-oriented research is, is and how we um, can engage and work with patient partners to build um, a more informed um, program. It's always frustrated me in the healthcare system because uh, that's where i live and breathe and work is um we'll build programs um, because we think we know um what we what is best um, but until you really meet with pe people who are using the programs um, you realize i realize very quickly that they know what is best even though i like to pretend that i'm a, I'm a patient or, or a caregiver but I'm, I'm really not so this here is a little image showing that uh of our story doing patient-oriented research where in the in the middle there you have uh, Tara uh, pulling patients and uh, that's myself and uh, Dr. Shauna Tierney, our co-medical lead, bringing us together to try to build a program that will work and be successful for our patients and for our, our healthcare system in British Columbia. <clears throat> So we did this public engagement process and, and the goal of the engagement was basically twofold. Um, it was to ensure that those most impacted by hospital at home's implementation had an opportunity to contribute um, their input, expertise and lived experience, um, thereby ensuring that hospital at home was designed from its inception uh, to meet the care needs of British Columbians. And also we wanted to make sure it met the needs of those who actually provide care um, to the patients, so the caregivers. We also wanted to ensure that our team, the hospital at home leadership team, had a clear understanding on what success um, should look like. So our formal engagement process um, consisted of interviews and an online survey. Um, as I mentioned, we had to pause things in September because of the election that took place here in BC. But uh, thanks to a, a research grant we had from the BC support unit, uh, the Vancouver Island Centre, we were able to contract Delaney and Associates to help um, conduct uh, the the telephone interviews with 23 individuals. And these individuals were um, uh, patients and, and caregivers. We had Victoria-based physicians who were both from the hospital as well as family practice settings. And we also had Island Health leaders who were both in the acute, acute care settings and the community, community settings. And it was also important us to ensure that we included uh, Ministry of Health leadership um, because I said early on that I will have failed as a, as a researcher in this space if at the end of the day uh, we don't have enough data to uh, provide to those who need to make a decision. And I wanted to hear from them early on about what they needed to know. Um, so we've been able to, um, to provide that data to them in the evaluation framework. <clears throat> So we had um, almost 800 people also complete our online survey and they were patients and caregivers, clinicians and clinical support. And it's on our Island Health website as well. All this, this these information as well as a short video um, from me. And um, we, uh, that's on our website if you're, if you're at all interested in, in, uh, in having a look at that. So the interviews yielded um, uh, five key program specific and evaluation specific um, themes. 
Uh, one of them was the first one was uh, patient health outcomes, uh, which focused on patient um, outcomes and recoveries, uh, hospital harms and complications, as well as lengths of stay and readmission rates, as those were important indicators of success um, to them. And uh, patients also made it crystal clear that they want to achieve their own health goals while, while receiving care. There was also process and policy measures, which emphasize the needs for both patients and caregivers and healthcare providers throughout the system. Um, it was identified uh, in a clear way that the hospital at home processes and training for patients and caregivers to follow, it was required to ensure that um, we had the correct processes in place and they knew what to do and how to reach out to the care team if they needed to return to the hospital, for example. Also clinicians and staff, who were interviewed relayed the need for clear protocols for charting and finding the best routes between hospital home patients, et cetera. The other clear thing that resonated throughout the process was the need for program communication. And uh, it was really important to all stakeholder groups and it was deemed to be vitally important to the success of the program. Uh, specifically communication amongst the care team to ensure that ongo ongoing uh, care coordination as well as effective communication between the care team and the patients and caregivers. We also had uh, patients and caregivers, they really wanted to know that they'd be able to reach their care team whenever they needed to and that the care team would respond um, promptly. Additionally, they wanted to receive clear communication about um, what they needed to do in order to provide care. There is a lot of desire on for program supports um, and many participants listed that we need to have adequate supplies, for example, in the house for um, success of the program. And we had to be aware of the burden on the caregiver um, to ensure they had appropriate supports in place um, to make sure that um, they were supported to provide care for their, um, for their loved one. And also program safety was the, the last thing. And it extended beyond the physical safety in relation to care, um, but there was an expressed desire for patients to achieve their own health outcomes, as I mentioned earlier. And participants spoke of the need to be able to quickly address health emergencies um, and of the need for patients and family members and various healthcare staff um, to all feel um, safe in the non-clinical environment, also known as their, their home. And finally, cultural safety and respect were also central themes included under the realm of patient safety. And then in addition to um, this, over the four month period, we, de we deployed the online public survey and um, to identify patients and family measures of success. We wanted to make sure that we were measuring um, and, in, in, and including these measures of success in our evaluation framework. Um, the patients also identified uh, robust safety measures um, like the communication and recognition of the importance of the caregiver role and making sure that they had the supports in place um, to reduce caregiver burden as priorities for the hospital at home uh, programs. So when we look at um, the hospital at home, um, oh, there's a slide that's missing there. I'll just talk about it then. Um, so as a, as a direct result for, from all of this feedback um, from our interviews and the online public engagement survey, uh, we actually implemented a virtual call bell. And uh, the, the virtual call bell, I'll talk about it in a few minutes, but it enabled patients to reach a, a member of their care team remotely at absolutely any time. Um, and the interesting thing is, is when we started off, we didn't even have this on our radar. And it was only because we actually had patient partners with us on our steering committee as welcome voices at the table who had a place. It wasn't just a checkbox that we were including them. And Andre and Elizabeth can speak to this. We actually, one of them, or two of them sit on our, on our hospital at home um, research team. They actually spoke to us about the importance of being able to actually push a button and contact the care team anytime they need from a place of safety. We also implemented a comprehensive communication platform to ensure that patients and family caregivers were easily able to contact their care team for support. There was a bunch of other little things that we implemented as well, like increasing the font sizes on the instruction sheets and um, little pieces like sanitizing their hands in front of patients, as opposed to sanitizing them in the car. Pa the patients and the caregivers wanted to see the nurse or the physician or the pharmacist actually sanitizing their hands as they were walking through the front door. <clears throat> So the implementation of it was really, really exciting. Um, for
First of all, so we have, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, um, basically this is a virtual unit. Patients are gonna be at their home. We have a bunch of technology that we've put in place to support the delivery of care. It doesn't provide the care, it just supports the delivery of care. And Cerner, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, is our electronic health record. So in a nutshell, we have a variety of members of the care team who actually provide the care. We have a hospital at home uh, hospitalist. We have a pharmacist in the team that provides operational and um, clinical pharmacy services to the patients to make sure that they're not experiencing any medical um, medication related issues. Obviously, uh, a patient is part of the team and the nursing staff is part of the, the care team. So when we get into the technology, um, we had a variety of pieces and um, we were actually pushed forward uh, very quickly to implement this. So we went from basically no program to an implemented functional program that was taking care of patients in probably about five months. Uh, and that was, that was moved forward because of uh, the, the pandemic. Um, and it became a priority. And it was just the most amazing process to be a part of because we had hundreds of people working on this. And I showed you that group earlier on of 26 or 28 departments that were involved to get us to go live. And now that we've, we, we, we are live and we have about 140 patients that we've cared for since November, we've had the ability to take a step back and, um, and discuss and think about uh, what we're doing, what we're gonna keep, what we can improve on. We implemented this technology at the outset. It was important to us that we had an LTE enabled touchscreen tablet. Um, this came also from our patient partners and through our discussions, but it's easy to have a tablet in the, in the patient's home that hooks up to their Wi-Fi. But when you think about delivering a service that has to be equitable and accessible to many different socioeconomical classes of people who live in different areas, um, we cannot rely solely on um, that everybody will have Wi-Fi and that everybody will have a computer to log into. So we provided a tablet and it was important that it was LTE enabled so that we could actually set it up in the hospital and they were ready to go um, before they, they got home. We also um, have a Bluetooth uh, B, uh, blood pressure monitor, a thermometer, pulse oximeter, and a scale for some of our heart failure patients that we use. And that we also have some videos that we can go back and forth doing a, a video conferencing uh, with them as well. So the patient takes their own vitals and they actually uploads directly into the system and it comes back to us in the hospital. And uh, we have it on our dashboard here. Quite often the nurses will do it when they're there as well. Um, but if the patient pushes their, their call button, for example, um, we may ask them, depending on how they're feeling, to actually take a set of vitals and send it back to us. The thought was that if we have this technology in place, it will actually um, allow us to further reach and be more efficient in our delivery of care. The other thing is, is you know, when we're in the hospital, when patients are in the hospital, I can walk, I'm in my office right now at the hospital, we can walk to the wards and most patients are laying in their beds. They don't get up. They sometimes walk around the, the ward for a few minutes, but they're basically bed bound. What we found through our program is that patients are up and about. And it was important to us to have the technology available so that the patient, maybe they wanna go out in their garden. I never even thought about that until we started meeting with patients. And they're like, well, if I'm feeling up to it, I may wanna just go out and pull a few weeds. I don't know who would wanna go out and pull weeds, but regardless, maybe they wanna go out and pull a few weeds in their garden. And they may be out of the Wi-Fi range. So having even the call bell as LTE enabled was really important. The other thing is, is which we heard from our public engagement work is the, the need for um, communication and essential communication. Um, so it has to be secure. We can't just use iMessage because um, um, that doesn't satisfy um, all the security uh, features that we needed. So we implemented something called uh, Vocera Secure Text Messaging. And all the clinical staff have uh, Island Health uh, provided uh, iPhones, if you will, with this app on them. And we can talk with each other um, with all the confidential information being shared. We can talk diagnosis, name, age, et cetera, and it's all to totally good. Um, we know who's on and we can communicate uh, seamlessly with the patients and we actually, or with the, the care team. We actually use this to check in from a clinician safety perspective. 
Well, before we go into the house, we will we will text, send a text message, just a secure text message, say, hey, I'm about to head into this house. And then when we leave the house, um, they'll send another text message saying back into the car or whatever, just from a, a, a staff safety um, pers perspective. We can also send uh, pictures, um, um, but and eventually we want to have them uploaded into the EHR as well, but currently they're not there. <clears throat> So as I mentioned before, we do have the uh, virtual call bell and uh, it's this little tiny button. And right now, this is what we implemented out of the, uh, at the start and um, it's working pretty well. Um, everything I think has a few areas that we'd like to improve upon, but it has 24 seven monitoring, it's waterproof. Uh, they push a button, it goes to a, a basically, I'll call it an operator. And uh, depending on the urgency of the call, they will pass it on to the care team or if, it's, uh, um, if, if it detects a, a fall, um, then they will actually call 911 or if there's a, a problem, they will call 911 directly for us and then, and then let the care team know. Um, it has a built-in GPS as well. And um, as I mentioned, they can shower with it, et cetera. Um, basically all they have to do is push the button and charge it up overnight and, uh, and it will, uh, will work. Um, well, the animation doesn't work here. And there's a picture of it behind here, but uh, it's just a little tiny button, fits in the palm of your hand, if you will, and it hangs on a lanyard. Throughout the, the process, we have actually done an implementation evaluation and a formative evaluation. So my research assistant every two weeks calls um, patients who give permission to be contacted. So uh, on discharge from the program, we ask the patients and the caregivers, would you be willing for us to contact you and learn um, from you um, about your experiences in the hospital and home program. This here is just an example. This one I think is from early February, but every two weeks we truly have uh, uh, almost doing regular, I don't want to call them PDSAs, but we're basically a, a learning health system where we actually are learning from the patients. We're gathering information from the patients and myself and the rest of the leaders with the hospital and home program meet on a regular basis. And we take the information that we glean from the experiences of patients who have actually truly experienced our program to Im um, improve and adjust our program. And an example would be that we, we can do all the planning in the, in the world that we want to do, but until you formally evaluate it, and, um, and, uh, and we're going to do research on it as well, you just don't know what the experiences are. So an example by us phoning and interviewing these patients, we learned that one of the patients actually got transferred back to the hospital, which we knew about obviously, um, but we didn't realize that they actually got charged for the transfer, the ambulance trip back, and that shouldn't have happened. So we reimbursed them for that fee, but also changed our processes and so that that doesn't happen to other people. And it's only through doing a, a proper structured formative evaluation, implementation evaluation that we will learn that. So up until um, we have 100% of patients who had said if they were in the same position again, that they would choose hospital at home instead of receiving um, care in the hospital uh, building. And we've had a relatively positive feedback throughout the experiences. Um, but what we're focusing on now, it's wonderful to hear the positive feedback, but the real, the real exciting feedback in the area that we can really dig into is the areas for uh, improvement. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, learning health system, to me, this is uh, the future of what we're, uh, what we're looking at and, um, and having uh, happen, um, where we get data, um, we interpret the data, we get the feedback, we implement some sort of change, and um, we assemble it and, and analyze it. And it's really important um, that we actually feed that back in a regular system, because research in general and what we're doing right now, we're producing our research protocol. Uh, we're going to submit it for ethics application, but we wanted to wait. We didn't want to do research on this brand new program that we are actually literally morphing every day to improve it. We want it to be stable. So we're probably going to start the research project in September or October and run it for 18 months. And as you can appreciate, when you do a formal research on something, usually you don't want to make changes to the model um, midstream to make sure that your results are, are, uh, are valuable. So the next steps, um, where we're going from here. <clears throat> basically, um, 
we have a variety of uh, impacts in the patient and family caregivers. As I mentioned, we implemented the uh, virtual call bell. Uh, we also implemented um, the comprehensive communication platform uh, with voice and, uh, and text messaging. <clears throat> Um, we also have uh, an evaluation framework that is uh, truly grounded in the patient and family caregivers priorities. Um, it's not just a bunch of administrators or clinicians who think that these are what we need to evalu evaluate. Granted, their feedback was also included in, in that, um, but it was also patients and, and family caregivers who told us what was truly important to them. And at the end of the day, we're all taxpayers in this beautiful province. Uh, we should have a say and, and that's why it was really important to us to provide to do it this way and, and to provide this uh, opportunity to hear from people. The other thing is, is it's a sort of a less tangible, but it's actually no less critical of an impact is there's been an incremental shift in organizational um, culture. Uh, we by inviting the patients and families to the table and, and valuing their input. There's been a shift towards collaboration. Uh, inclusivity and respect, as well as a greater understanding of the value that the patient and family caregiver partners brings as experts in their own experiences. And as I mentioned earlier, as clinicians and decision makers, uh, our focus is on patient care every day, and we often think that we know what's best. Um, but what our, our team came to appreciate through this journey is that we aren't patients, and if we truly want to design and implement a program that's going to work, we need to invite um, the patients and families to have input. And so that's what, uh, that's what we did. And um, it really has a less hierarchical decision-making process now. And, um, and they're welcomed uh, as, as equals in the process at the table. We're gonna continue working um, with our patient partners and key stakeholders as we refine and expand our hospital at home program. And we also wanna make sure that our, our knowledge translation strategy uh, moves well beyond the traditional academic model. Um, we like it to um, to reach out in various uh, ways as well, and also um, go to. We were just at an international conference on hospital at home, presenting some of our work uh, there. We're up at. Uh, we we're supposed to be in Austria, uh, Ven uh, Vienna, Austria, last week, um, but we did it virtually because of the pandemic, obviously. But we're trying to reach out in different ways. We have a few different. Um, uh, publications that are uh, in the making right now, and one of them is uh, is accepted for for publication um, about uh, uh, it's been novel how we've implemented a, a clinical pharmacist into the program. Um, and the final thing is uh, we're going to be sharing our learnings with the various uh, groups around um, uh, in the hospital home community. This here is just an example of our poster that's actually up on our website. Um, highlighting what we've done and how we've in, in, uh, involved various people and why we did the public engagement um, work. And as you can see on there, Andre and Elizabeth uh, and Tara, myself are, are listed as, uh, as authors on this work that we're in the process of publishing. And um, as I mentioned earlier, our evaluation framework um, is, uh, it's basically going through all the different pieces of the quadruple lane where we looked at acceptability implementation right now. We're going to look at patient and caregiver experiences. Uh, we're going to do, be doing staff and clinician experiences and how it's what it's like to provide care. Uh, we really want to make sure we're improving quality of care. And if we're not, we want to adjust our program. So it is. And uh, I think cost as a publicly funded healthcare system, it's so very important to ensure that we are look, doing a full cost analysis as we go through this, this process. At the end of the day, we feel very fortunate as a, as a clinical team, as a research team, as an evaluation team, um, to be in a position where we're able to be supported to do this work. And I know that data and experiences and sharing them in a meaningful, digestible way is the only way that others in this um, country and others in other countries that are looking at this work are going to be able to um, take it and utilize it to improve their programs. So on that note, um, we'd like to uh, thank you for listening to us for the last 41 minutes. And um, we'd like to take the opportunity to, to ask a few, a few questions. And uh, Andre, I do have a uh, that's about a five minute video that we, we may or may not uh, share depending on um, the questions.
Okay, great. Thanks a lot. That's excellent. Um, if you have questions, you can either raise your hand or pipe in the chat box. Um,